Welcome everyone to our final panel discussion of the day. Um, it's great to see such a wonderful turnout. Thank you all for being here. We really have a wonderful panel lined up for you. Um, and uh, we're, we're excited to get started. So my name is Tori Cook. I'm a member of Buckley's student board and the editor-in-chief of Buckley's publication, The Beacon, which you can find copies of if you're interested in the lobby. Um, but yeah, in, in 1701, the Connecticut legislature passed an act establishing Yale as a collegiate school where youth may be instructed in the arts and sciences and, quote, fitted for public employment, end quote. In short, Yale was meant to turn out respectable public servants and leaders, which is very much still in the spirit of its goals and works today. And yet, a Forbes survey from August of this year found that 33% of hi hiring managers reported being less likely to hire Ivy League graduates than five years ago. Just two, two years ago, several federal judges called for a boycott on hiring graduates from Yale Law School in response to free speech concerns. More and more, perceptions of ideological capture and shallow learning surround graduates from elite schools. This panel joins together reputable college leadership, high-profile public servants, and keen cultural critics to discuss what American government, think tanks, and social institutions seek in their leaders, and what that might mean for the kind of intellectually diverse and challenging education Yale should be focusing on for its students today. We can't wait to dive in, but before we do, allow me to introduce the guests for our panel. Pano Canelos is founding president of the University of Austin. He was, uh, of the University of Austin. He was previously president of St. John's College in Annapolis, the nation's storied Great Burke's Liberal Arts College, during which time he successfully launched a historic initiative that included the most significant tuition reduction at any American college. He is widely acclaimed as one of the country's most powerful advocates for liberal education. He was previously dean of the Honors College at Valparaiso University and held appointments in English and theater at Loyola University Chicago, the University of San Diego, and Stanford University. An ardent Shakespeare fan and scholar, he has published widely, including the Shakespeare and the Stage series. He holds a PhD from the Committee on Social Thought at University of Chicago, an MA from Boston University, and a BA in English from Northwestern University. Robert Doerr is pr president of the American Enterprise Institute. He became AEI's 12th president in July 2019, leading one of the nation's oldest and most respected public policy think tanks. Since becoming president of AEI, Mr. Dorr has recruited dozens of leading scholars and fellows across multiple issue areas and launched a new research division focused on social, cultural, and constitutional studies. By supporting the extensive work of AEI scholars in areas including foreign and defense policy, education, the reform of key institutions, and the U.S. economy, Mr. Dorr has helped to solidify AEI's position as a leading voice on the major issues facing the United States. Mr. Doerr joined AEI in 2014 to lead the Institute's Opportunity and Mobility Studies program after serving for more than 20 years in leadership positions in the social service programs of New York State and New York City. Charles C.W. Cook is senior editor at National Review and author of the Conservatarian Manifesto. Along with National Review, he has written for several other prominent publications, including the New York Times, Washington Post, and Los Angeles Times, to name a few. Mr. Cook is host of the Charles C.W. Cook podcast, where he talks to experts and fellow compatriots in journalism about everything from politics and technology to music and golf carts. In an episode from September of this year, he discussed academic freedom with Yale Law Professor Keith Whittington, whom we just heard from, if you were at the previous panel, which included a discussion on how to prevent universities from becoming ideological bubbles. He is a graduate of the University of Oxford, at which he studied modern history and politics. He moved to the United States in 2011, became an American citizen in 2018, and lives in sunny Florida with his wife and two children. We'll begin by hearing opening remarks on the topic from each of our panelists. Dr. Canelos, if you would please begin. Well, thank you, Tori, for the introduction. Thank you for calling me reputable. I, I think I was grateful. <laughs> <laughs> it's very nice. Um, I, so I have a thesis that I'm going to introduce, but before I do that, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be very pedantic, and I'm going to kind of, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the history of universities, what they have been and maybe what they should be. Um, 
I, I, I've always I've always leaned into Cardinal Newman's definition of the mission of a university that is simply a place where we see things as they are, and I think that's something good. But I also agree entirely um, with uh, Professor Christakis's um, embrace of universities as places for the discovery of knowledge, the transmission of knowledge, and the preservation of knowledge. Um, in fact, it's knowledge, I think, that's the key word in all of this. Universities have always been places that prepare graduates for the knowledge economy. Even back in the earliest days, when 1088, when Bologna was founded, and soon after Cambridge and, and Oxford and, and the Sorbonne, uh, back then, the knowledge economy was rather limited. There were very few professions that were primarily intellectual in nature. There was the law, medicine, and theology. And that's pr primarily what these institutions prepared their graduates to pursue. Um, the knowledge that, uh, that these institutions focused on was something I would, I would think of as guild knowledge or craft knowledge, the knowledge of how to do particular things. And, and their mission was to transmit that knowledge from one generation of practitioners to the next. As universities evolved over time um, and sort of fast forwarding to the United States, we had the development of the collegiate system here, places like Yale, which started as Yale College and Harvard College, uh, Princeton, which started as the King's College. Um, the purpose of these institutions is also primarily the transmission of certain kinds of knowledge. Uh, they, they, they're preparing a kind of uh, a cultural elite through programs that develop cultural literacy and character development. Right? So the, the idea was, again, to kind of craft a certain kind of person who would play a certain role in society. Uh, things changed around the turn of the 18th to the 19th century, beginning in, of all places, Prussia, with the, with the kind of um, uh, revision of the, of the educational system uh, in Prussia under a fellow named Wilhelm von Humboldt, who introduced into the German university system the idea of the research university, that, that the purpose of universities wasn't the transmission of knowledge, but the discovery of knowledge or production of knowledge. So what, what von Humboldt was trying to do is, is capture that kind of enlightenment sense that human beings are here to seek truth, pursue knowledge, primarily in a secular context. And that model became the model that predominated in the US about a century later. Because during the 19th century, if you were an American who wanted to get a PhD, you had to pretty much go to Germany, sometimes UK for that. So those who were returning to teach brought that model with them, the research model. Um, and then we saw institutions convert from colleges to universities. Harvard College became Harvard University. Yale College became Yale University. Mottos were changed. Harvard College's an original motto was not Veritas. It was something along the lines, and in, in Christi Gloria, I'm not sure if that's exactly what it was, but it was directly referring to the preparation of ministers. But now with this new secularized Enlightenment Humboldtian model, all right, Harvard took a more uh, innocuous motto, one that had no particular faith connection and was conveniently Latin, Veritas as its kind of beacon, as did Yale with Lux at Veritas. So why does all this matter? Well, it matters because when we get to the 20th century, these schools that had been predominantly preparing, polishing an elite, now had to deal with the fact that the knowledge economy that had been relatively limited during the development of, uh, of Western civilization became the predominant part of the co economy. In the 20th century, we saw the massification of the knowledge economy, and then the massification of universities. We needed more and more people who can work, do work that was primarily intellectual in nature. 
And what does that mean? Simply, we needed to train people to, in the mastery of language, mastery of numbers, and the mastery of symbols. And those who could best master those things would be most successful in this economy. And so universities became places that filtered for those skills, filtered for the aptitude to be able to master language, language and numbers and symbols. This is where we saw, for example, the SAT uh, arise in the, in the early 20th century to look for, for young people who had those talents and to cultivate them. So where does that bring us now? And why does this, how does this relate to the crisis that Tori was talking about, the fact that many employers do not, are not as eager to hire graduates from places like Yale or other elite institutions as they were in the past. Um, the mastery of language, the mastery of number, the mastery of symbols depends on the free and dynamic exchange of ideas that allows complex analysis and synthesis. So if you're filtering for people who can you know, engage in this sort of mysterious thing we think of as critical thinking, to hone the mind, they have to be able to challenge themselves with ideas. The mind is a muscle. Muscles can only be strengthened by tension, by conflict, by pressure. So if we have an environment now where universities are no longer encouraging the free and open exchange of ideas, we are no longer preparing those young people to engage in the very difficult work of the life of the mind outside of universities. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll just conclude with this, we have created a system in which to get into one of the elite universities, students learn very early on, I have high school kids now, I'm in the middle of this, that the way to um, be accepted through the admissions process at elite university is to follow a very narrow path, to check a lot of boxes, to do a lot of safe things, to conform, to avoid risk. And so the kids who are successfully getting into places like Yale, many of them, I'm sure none of them in this room, but many of the students out there have been beaten into being conformist. And then they get here, and what do they learn here? Shut up. Keep your opinion to yourself. Do you want the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? Don't make a fuss. And so imagine the compounding problem where the nation's best and brightest students, rather than having their, uh, their creativity activated, rather than encouraging them to think in heterodox ways, encouraging them to think outside the box, we're telling them that their future and success depends not upon heterodoxy, but upon orthodoxy, not about challenging paradigms, right? but by conforming to stories that have already been told. And I think the compound effect of that on the culture is very problematic, and I would like to see more and more graduates from Yale have the kind of intellectual uh, authenticity that I see from students who are part of this, uh, part of the Buckley Institute and in this milieu. So thank you. Ready? Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Tori. I'm Robert Doerr. I'm the president of AEI, and I am very honored to be on this panel with such distinguished panelists, and also very honored and pleased to be at the Buckley Institute. You know, if Buckley Institute calls, I come. That's my motto. I, I, I love what you all do, and I greatly appreciate it. And I took the challenge and the question very seriously. Can intellectual diversity restore the reputation of elite university graduates? And it's certainly would help. Uh, there isn't any question, and it is a problem. At AEI, I have, my work is in safety net policy, but as president, I'm basically an administrator. And I hire a lot of young people, and I bring a lot of young people to AI to serve as interns, and we have a summer program for college students. And it is a fact that we are finding students from Hillsdale and from Calvin and from the University of North Carolina and from Purdue uh, who are bringing a, a light to the building that doesn't always come from Princeton, Harvard, and Yale students. And uh, it is a big problem. It's not only a problem for me as a hirer, who sees this and feels it, 
It's also a problem for, the, for, for me as a, as, a, as a product of one of these universities who senses that out in the country, I travel a lot, um, the reputation of these elite universities has really been harmed. And it breaks my heart. And the question is, what can the universities do to correct that problem and restore their reputation as they should be? And it, they're, it's, it's based on legitimate facts and a real perception of a complete lack of viewpoint diversity and other things we've read about in the newspaper. But the viewpoint diversity, I think, is the biggest. Um, we had a situation where we had a prominent uh, elite university president asked a question in front of our community. What percentage of your faculty is conservative? And he responded with a straight face, 15%. And everyone in the audience laughed. And, and, and it was, and there was justifiable in that regard. So the real question isn't that it would, a little more viewpoint diversity or a lot more viewpoint diversity on these campuses would restore their reputation. It's how do you do that? Um, and one way I think you, you shouldn't do it, but is being done a lot, and that is they're calling the president of the American Enterprise Institute and asking us to provide speakers periodically. Or maybe, maybe we'll, we'll let one of your, your faculty come up and teach a course for a semester. It'll make our donors feel better. It'll make, make us look a little better. But I don't know that it really changes, and I worry that in some regard, AI is being used as window dressing. So to me, what it takes is really strong leadership from the administrators of the major universities who are willing to go out and recruit, to accept this as a problem, and to push through the hiring of faculty that changes this imbalance. Now what that runs into, and uh, Pano knows this better than, than, than I do, is this question of, um, academic freedom and departmental control. And I've heard university presidents, very prominent university presidents of great stature and great authority plead complete weakness and incapacity when it comes to hiring because of the way the faculty uh, controls the hiring process. But what I don't think that is about is what uh, Keith Whittington talked about earlier, which is academic freedom. I absolutely support and would fight to the last, you know, last person to protect a faculty member's right to say and speak and say what they want, uh, because that's academic freedom. But to fight to protect a department that has hired a lot of people who all think like them and will only hire other people who think like them is to me, the innocent non-academic, doesn't make sense. They're not the same thing. And so, and there are examples, again, others know the examples much better than I, of hard charging, ambitious, aggressive, recruiting presidents of universities, the, the history of the University of Chicago at the beginning of the last century. Even, I, I, now I've got to say something that may upset you, I went to Princeton. Uh, the president there, President Bowen, the recent biography of him by Nancy Weiss revealed just the extent to which he went to great lengths to control and manipulate and influence the hiring process so he could really improve departments that needed a lot of improvement. So I think that's one ingredient. I also think that um, when you, you faced with that also, the way another workaround that's happened, which I think is available, it, it seems more, it's good, I wish both would happen, and that is, and we have scholars at AI, Ben and Jenna Story, who are promoting the idea of creating new schools of civic thought. And so Ben goes down to the University of North Carolina, and he gets invited to brief the, the, the Board of Trustees. He's an alumni of the University of North Carolina, he says, um, Ben is a former professor at Furman and a full-time scholar at AI, and a, 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 a graduate of, your, of the program at the University of Chicago. He says, University of North Carolina is not what it was when I went here. It doesn't have the kind of vibrancy. It doesn't have the kind of viewpoint diversity. You need to do something about it. The Board of Trustees votes unanimously with the chancellor there to direct the chancellor to create a new school and they, that gets out because that's news. 
The faculty is in an uproar because they weren't consulted. So there's a lot of back and forth and t tension. But the university held strong, the trustees held strong, and of course, the state legislature offered money, and that department's been created. And now there's 20 tenure level faculty positions that they need to fill. And they're not going to say, and they shouldn't say, well, we're just going to go out and find a bunch of conservatives. But it does give them an opportunity to bring some viewpoint diversity into a new department, creating a new discipline. And they're going to use it that way. And that's, being, that's happening at the University of Florida. It's happening at the University of Texas. We are in, in, in conversations with the people at Johns Hopkins. President Daniels there wants to do something about this. The pre new president, Purdue president of Washington University, Daniel Deermeyer. These are all people, and I say this as a sort of Yale Princetonian, we're all in this together, that are eating our lunch. He's eating our lunch. <laughs> and so it has to happen because it, it's, and you, you can see it in the, in the, and I guess I would just say uh, two more things, three more things about this. Um, you can see it in the, in, the, in the way the country has reacted to elites. If you don't think the anti-elite sentiment in America isn't related to Yale, that's ridiculous. Of course it is. It's related to all of us in these elite universities. And we, as Ron Daniels at Johns Hopkins would say, deserve it. So a se another thing you need to do, and this came up, there's been references to this, and Larry Summers has spoken out, 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 uh, outspokenly about this, is you can't be requiring faculty members to get hired to sign DEI statements. I mean, that, you just can't do that. And again, and again, this was brought up to an elite president of the university by another elite of a pre elite president of an elite university. And the, the, the response was, well, I agree. I hate those. As a constitutional law scholar, I have a problem with those but I don't control my departments. These are departmental decisions. And I don't really, I, I have a hard time believing that being against those violates academic freedom. Um, I think being for them violates academic freedom. So that's another thing. Um, and then the last point I'll say, and this is one that I, I is, you know, I, I, feel, I felt when I brought it up with someone who was the president of a major university that I was maybe touching a third rail. Um, but may, I guess not, because his reaction was very positive. Um, in order to create intellectual diversity at campuses, you not only have to bring more faculty and different faculty with different perspectives, you also have to bring more students with different perspectives. And you got to talk to the admissions office, because um, there is something going on there where uh, students that are coming to these universities aren't ideologically diverse. And um, I can't believe it's because all the conservatives aren't smart enough. And so, and, and so I raised this with a prominent university president, and he said, absolutely, I'm talking to the admissions office. I say to them, and this was the quote he said, bring me some, get me some conservative students to help me out in these battles I want to have. And I think that's a, a, a major issue. Um, and so I, I, I got to tell you, I think the reputation of these great universities has been tarnished. Some people have gone out to create new universities and start fresh. Others, and I think with people who've created new universities with your support, are trying to get the great universities to reform and get better. We need to do both. But unless universities of these great, of, who have these great qualities make these changes, if they don't, smart kids and smart families and smart parents are going to go somewhere else. And smart people who hire those smart people are going to hire those kids, not the products of Yale, Princeton, and Harvard. Well, thank you for having me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to press this button on my watch because I'm told I speak quite slowly. People who listen to my podcast apparently listen to it at three times speed. And <laughs> one, one guy emailed me recently and said he listens to my podcast at three times speed um, and he slows Ben Shapiro's down three times. And 
then we end up saying the same number of words over half an hour. So I just want to make sure I don't go on. Um, so I remain um, astonished at the number of these sort of panels, sometimes debates, that I'm invited to or that I attend on college campuses and in media institutions. Not because they aren't worthwhile, they absolutely are, but because if you step back, you would think that those were the last two institutions where we would be debating free speech and diversity of thought. If you, if you stop for a moment and consider that the places in the United States where we have the biggest problem with open inquiry are colleges and the media, it's lunacy. It's lunacy. Those are the institutions that rely the most or ought to rely the most on free speech. And yet, over the years, uh, by part, uh, by design, they've been taken over. I noticed on the previous panel, Alex from FIRE said that Harvard had started asking prospective students whether or not they believed it was acceptable to shout down or even be violent towards those with whom they disagreed. Uh, what she didn't say was whether or not Harvard thought it was a good or a bad thing. <laughs> I'm slightly worried that they're now filtering for people who want the violence towards the speakers rather than the other way around. I think at root, what bothers me about this the most is that if you go to a good college and you end up in a stultifying, stifled environment, you're just not going to fulfill your potential or learn what you should. And I, I find this astonishing um, as someone who went to Oxford in 2004 and saw precisely none of what we're now talking about until I'd left. So I often um, am asked by Americans about my time at college with the assumption that it was, uh, it was full of wokeness because Europe does tend in that direction, although a lot of what we're talking about is actually an American export. Um, but it, it wasn't. You know, I had professors who were all over the map. I had a professor who was a Marxist, and you'd never have known it in the way that he taught. And the best thing that happened to me in my entire time at Oxford was I went one evening to one of the college bars. Those who listen to the editors will know that most of my stories start with me being in a bar somewhere. We went to a college bar, and I got talking to this, this guy I didn't know, and he said he was a, a socialist. And I wasn't a socialist, although I didn't have politics at that point that were particularly defined. And I started arguing with him uh, about politics. He was very good natured, we're drinking beers and talking. And he completely and utterly kicked my ass from top to bottom. I mean, he was just better than I was. He was better informed. He was a better debater. He'd clearly thought through a whole bunch of topics that I hadn't. And I didn't think coming out of it, well, he's right, I'm a socialist now, but I did think I wasn't good enough in that debate. I didn't know enough. I need to go away and think through my positions and learn why it was that I was unable to persuade him or frankly, even persuade myself. That was a good thing that happened to me. Losing can be really useful as an experience. But if you operate in an environment in which that's discouraged, you're just never going to get that. And if you never get that, you're never going to improve. Um, so the first of this that I saw was actually after I had left Oxford. There's a debating society at Oxford called the Oxford Union. It was set up uh, to be a venue for free speech in the Victorian era. And they're very big on this at the Oxford Union. It's set up like the Houses of Parliament. They have two sides, they have dispatch boxes, all sorts of arcane traditions. Um, when I was there, it was really a place where anything went. Um, when I left, I still lived in the city. Uh, there was a bit of a contretemps. Uh, the the uh, students who ran the Oxford Union invited to a debate a man called Nick Griffin, who was the 
head of the British National Party at the time. And the BNP is a gross institution. Essentially, he's a fascist. Uh, and they invited him, and they were going to have people on the other side of the debate. And the idea was he would say why he was a fascist, and then people who weren't fascists, which is most people, would argue with him in front of the audience. And this event got shut down because of a backlash. Uh, people who opposed the debate stormed the Oxford Union in balaclavas, holding signs, and I will never forget seeing this for the first time, that read, no free speech for fascists. So what you had was people, people who looked like Hamas terrorists shutting down the debate in the name of liberty. And they caved, they caved. That event never happened. And I suppose that was my first taste of it. And what I thought then is what I think now. Every time I see this sort of thing on a college campus, that it is ultimately the product of a civilizational underconfidence and a total lack of trust in your fellow citizens. What did they think was going to happen? The Oxford Union holds 450 people. By definition, most of the people who are students at Oxford, as at Yale, are pretty intelligent, pretty discerning. Did they think that all of these people from different parts of the world were going to go in, watch the debate, and goose step out? Did they really think so? It's insulting. It's just an insulting presumption. That's not what was going to happen. Uh, and the idea that that ridiculous little man who's the head of the British National Party was going to brainwash every student sh sh simply by being there um, I thought at the time was, was ridiculous. Um, so I, I think what worries me about it is that it, it turns universities into essentially credential machines where the purpose of the college education is not to actually do anything but to get the piece of paper that at one point signified uh, that you had done something worthwhile. And I'll finish uh, on, a, on a pessimistic note, um, which is that I, I think this is going to get worse before it gets better because of what happened on Tuesday night. Um, I have been watching the explanations promulgated uh, from the left side of the aisle now for 10, 15 years as to why they don't win. And at one point, it was money. It was money in politics. This was huge. Citizens United was to blame. There was too much money in politics. Uh, now, Bernie Sanders still believes this to his credit, he's been consistently wrong, but the party writ large, the left writ large, has moved away from this because their side has started to raise a lot more money than the right. In fact, this election was a great example of it. One side raised a billion dollars, that was the Democrats, one side spent 300 million or what you will. Because of that, that explanation no longer really flies. They don't really want to get money out of politics. So what they've landed on, and you saw it coming before the election, I think you're really going to see it flower now, is misinformation. Misinformation, disinformation, lies, the idea that there is some shady network of podcasts and renegade publishers who are brainwashing people into voting against their own interests. And I think uh, that in the short term, we're going to see the uh, institutions uh, of, of which Yale is one go more down that road, um, not less. But the good news, the good news here uh, is that there is only so far that you can push that before the reputation starts to suffer, before people start saying, well, actually, I'm quite interested in what Pano is doing. Uh, my kids will go there instead. I'm quite interested in what Hillsdale is doing. I will go there instead. And I do think the market will ultimately correct it. But I think this is actually a moment of higher challenge, uh, not lower. Thank you all so much. This is, this is so great. I'm really excited to get into questions. Um, before we turn it over to the audience, I kind of wanted to open this up with a question for specifically the students in the room. We've talked about a lot of reasons why this stigma is, has been created and what people are seeing that is causing them to be concerned. For the students in the room who will most likely not be in college when this problem is solved, if ever, 
what can they do and keep top of mind as they're trying to position themselves professionally? Is there a role for consumption of or participation in alternative media, uh, things like vocal political activism, or is that one of the problems? How can students trying to position themselves coming from these universities with these sorts of stigmas, um, how can they position, position themselves professionally um, despite these you know, difficulties? Uh, I, I would like to start off by that because I am in this business of hiring students all the time and I'm also traveling to college campuses a lot and, and, I, and I know it came up in an earlier session. Um, uh, it's, not, it's, it's not helpful. Sometimes um, conservative or different thinking students uh, will say to me, um, I'm afraid to speak out, I self-censure because of being shunned or treated and I have not don't have that much patience for that among Yale and Princeton and Harvard students because they are Yale Princeton and Harvard students and I was one too and I think that um, they need to need to not be afraid to be a part of the Buckley Institute to speak up in classroom to challenge uh, their fellow students and the faculty and to be active to write op-eds that take strong positions uh, because I'm so, I, 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 it, it pains me to talk to a, a, a senior in college who, who is afraid to, to take a chance or speak out. And so one way, if you're trying to avoid the stigma, I think that's the way you said it, is to make it clear to people who would hire you that you were brave and that you wrote and said. You might do it with some humility. You might say, you know, I've learned from that. I, I hired a young man. He writes um, often for National Review, Tal Fortang. Uh, some of you may remember him. He wrote an essay while he was at Princeton that um, challenged this check your privilege language. It got a million hits on time. He was a notorious sophomore at Princeton. Um, and I went to get him, and I wanted him to come to work at AI, and I, we met at Bryant Park in New York City, and I said, Tal, uh, how, uh, how'd that all work out? And he said, well, you know, I, I, I learned a lot from that, and there's some of what I wrote then, maybe I might not write it exactly that way. And that was great. And of course, he came to AI, and then he went to NYU Law School, and now he's published all over the place. So I just, uh, that's one thing, get, do that, and uh, instead of saying I was a conservative that was afraid to talk out because even though I went to Yale or Princeton or Harvard, I was worried about my reputation. I'd, I'd offer this to the students who are here. Um, you guys are the ones who are gonna win, Yeah. all right? <laughs> Your peers are sheep. You, <laughs> you are the eagles. Okay, to, and you're gonna soar. And outside the hot house of these ridiculous environments called universities, the world is on your side. All right, so be mavericks, be strong, just do it. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree with that. I don't think we should downplay that it's difficult. I mean, the, it's rational for a lot of people not to. That doesn't mean it's admirable. It doesn't mean they shouldn't do it anyway. But we should acknowledge that it is rational for a lot of people in these institutions to shut up. Because if you think about it, not everyone's going to go on to engage in a career that rewards them for being a maverick. And so if what you're looking for, especially in the way our culture now works, which I abhor, is a piece of paper, and you want to have the imprimatur of Yale or Princeton or Harvard or Oxford and you want to have good grades and you know that the best way to achieve that is to spend four years being quiet, a lot of people are going to do that, especially if they want to end up in a bank or a Unilever instead of a, a national review. Uh, so we have to acknowledge that and this is why I think it's really important to have institutions such as FIRE uh, that will help um, and encourage people to do so. Um, but I mean, ultimately, that is the right answer. You do just have to do it. You do just have to push through. But we ought to have a lot of sympathy for the people who are in that predicament, especially people who maybe didn't grow up with families that went 
um, to Yale historically. I mean, I'm, I'm the first person in my family ever to go to college. My dad left school at 15. Um, now, I didn't particularly care about the credential, which is why I'm sitting here on this panel. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't as if I had something to fall, fall back on. And I just think we ought to understand and remember that some of that change is not just going to come from people standing up and saying, I am Spartacus, but from the institutions themselves. And we have to push for that, too. Thank you so much. We're going to move it into audience question. And in the, the spirit of the discussion we've had, please, when you ask your question, identify yourself and say your connection with Buckley and or Yale. Um, and raise your hand, and you'll be brought a mic. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Michael Weingrad. I'm a uh, class of 1990 Yale. Uh, I'm also a professor of Jewish studies at Portland State University, a place that has known some of these, uh, these issues, although I'm happy to say that I'll be spending next semester as a visiting professor at Hillsdale, so I, I get to go from hell to heaven. <laughs> uh, I want to thank Pando for creating another heaven, and I want to thank Robert for pointing out uh, the, the systemic problems that we're dealing with, uh, that there is such a thing as ideological capture when uh, uh, statements about intellectual diversity no longer really work because everyone is already of the, the same viewpoint. And, uh, so I wanted to ask the question of uh, how, we, how we can affect things before we get to the hiring point. Uh, you're all well aware of the, the ideological and structural gauntlet of uh, PhD production uh, in which uh, you have to get past your, your dissertation committee. You have to formulate questions that are acceptable to the discourse of disciplines. Disciplines themselves uh, do not permit of, of uh, dissident or, or conservative thought. Um, so how can we, between the, the undergraduates and the, the potential new hires, um, how do we create that uh, something approaching a critical mass. 15% seems glorious. Uh, in most cases, we're dealing with. Even if it was true. Even if it was true, right. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I think I'll answer this. I don't know if this is a, a solution that's readily available to most institutions, but um, to identify the problem, uh, the the The, the Wuhan lab of ideological capture is the tenure system. Okay. <laughs> Don't quote me on that. I would get in trouble for all sorts of things. In other words, there's a, there, it, and the system is, is set up to give people unassailable jobs for life under the guise of academic freedom, but it's not really academic freedom because they never hire anybody who disagrees with them. They're secure in their job and they get to decide who gets hired and, and and then, and you know, for there, there are, it's, it's like a triple distillation. As you were mentioning, first you have to get through graduate school, and and if you're not um, on the progressive side of things, you're going to keep your head down and you're going to you're going to pass and and pretend. And then you go on the job market, you're going to do the same thing. And then if you get a job, you go through the next gate. You have six years before your tenure, and then they get to decide whether to tenure you or not. There's, by the time that, you, that you're one of the people who gets to be a decision maker, the people who might think differently have been completely filtered out of the system. The tenure system has to change. And uh, we do not have tenure at the University of Austin. All right? We just, uh, what we do, we have really robust contracts that say, do your job and we're gonna continue to reward you and employ you. I mean, imagine that, you know. How do you protect academic freedom? That's a very good question. All right. At University of Austin, what we have is in our constitution a separation of powers. We have an executive branch, the president and those who run the institution. We have a legislative branch, the people who make the rules, the, the boards of trustees, the faculty senates, the founders. We have a judicial branch, and this is a branch that sits outside the university that gets to be... Um, gets to assess whether or not we are sticking to our mission as constitutionally defined, which includes academic freedom. 
So if a faculty member feels their academic freedom has been impinged upon, there is a body outside the university that objectively that we can turn to that, that the university is obliged to, um, to abide by in terms of their founding. The chief justice on, our, our, on this, our adjudicative panel, by the way, is Robbie George. Uh, who many of you know, AI scholar, AI scholar and, uh, and, and, and there's a group of seven. So you have to create a process for um, accountability. So, sorry, that's a long-winded answer, but I think until we unwind the tenure system as it's currently construed, I don't think we're, gonna, we're always gonna have political asymmetry at the faculty level, which will, which will trickle down to the student level. And I would just add that this is the demand. If you create, if, if university leadership and universities make a demand for, for this a different kind of professor, a different, and, and the, the professors that will bring intellectual diversity to campus, that will, will help you get more supply. I mean, Yuval Levin would tell political science hotshots at AEI who said, I'm thinking of going in to get a PhD in political science, three or four years ago, he would have said, don't do it because there, if you're a conservative, there's no real opportunity for you. It's so tight. But now with the creation of these schools of civic thought where there's an opportunity for political scientists PhD to be hired through that route at a major university, um, there's, a, that there's a more of, a, more of a, a willingness to encourage a student to do that. But you need the demand. I would just simply add, I think this decision is going to in part be made by the public for universities, because you've got a perfect storm at the moment. You've got a huge increase in costs, um, notwithstanding President Biden's unconstitutional transfer of wealth from people who borrowed money and used it. To, um, but I, uh, I think that you've got a, a huge increase in the cost of, of higher education, and partly being driven by middle management, not increases in, in the product. You've got people who are realizing that they are uh, more educated than they need to be for the amount of money that they're making, which is a totally rational concern. Um, and you've got a justified drop in trust in what universities are putting out. You know, social science, you have the replication crisis. Half of the academics that people see on television are out of their minds. Um, and, uh, you know, when, when I was a kid, my dad, as I say, didn't, didn't we finished high school, if someone was on the radio from Oxford or Cambridge, he just assumed that they were right. I mean, he would assume that, well, they're very highly educated, they must know what they're talking about. You should listen to him now. And that's after his own son went. Um, <laughs> maybe because his own son went. Um, but I think that that combination is going to force change um, from, from the demand side. Thank you. Uh, my name is Roshan Detolf. I'm a first year at Pauli Murray College. And we've talked about this idea of departments only hiring uh, people that agree with the department. But uh, take, for example, like a health department, uh, where most of the people in the department believe in, say, like vaccinations. Do we hire the anti-vaxxer only for the sake of intellectual diversity, and if not, who decides where to draw the line in the sand? Uh, well, I do want to acknowledge that when I talk about this, I'm mostly talking about the social sciences and the, and the humanities. I, I don't think this problem is as severe in the sciences and engineering. Um, but, but, you know, I think that's a little bit of an, a, a, an extreme example. I, I don't, I don't, I, I, I I still want to uphold standards, and I, I'm not against, uh, you know, academic rigor. I just can't believe that conservatives can't achieve that rigor in so many departments in major universities in America. Yeah, I, I just think that question is totally reasonable on its own terms, but usually it is used to justify all manner of other selection bias that is not. It's a little bit like that awful line from the uh, Supreme Court decision, Schenck, the 
falsely shout fire in a crowded theater, which in and of itself is defensible. You can argue whether or not one should be able to do that, but was actually in practice used to prevent a immigrant who only spoke Yiddish from complaining about the First World War. And so because people didn't want to say, I think we should imprison immigrants who only speak Yiddish from complaining about the First World War, they said, well, you can't shout fire falsely in a crowded theater. I mean, yeah, if, if we're talking about a physics department where somebody who's applying thinks the world is flat, then yeah, maybe we don't want to hire them. The problem is that that kind of argument usually means that, um, that we don't want to hire people to a politics department who aren't communists. And I just think that, you know, um, it, it, it's taken so so far, it's become so um, endemic in academia that, that the center of gravity in the hiring committees is just off. I'd, I'd add one thing to this. I think I actually avoid the term um, intellectual diversity and prefer intellectual pluralism. And I'll, I'll explain why, and it, it bears upon this. The, the term diversity as we commonly use it now has become really reductionist. Like there are just two sides to everything. There's a, a blue and a red, a left and a right. And so the question, you know, if you're looking for, um, you know, a variety of opinions in the department, do we hire somebody that we assume that there's one thing we do hire somebody who believes the exact opposite? And to me that that's sort of intellectually, um, uh, you know, thin. I think what you're really looking for in a department is some sort of intellectual pluralism. That is, people who are coming at common problems from a variety of different angles. And so the question should be when you're hiring somebody is, how do they broaden or enrich the dialogue that we're having? Not do they believe the opposite of what I believe? So I think that's a, a way to frame that. We have time for about one more question. Thank you. Um, my name is Justin. I'm a Buckley Fellow and a first year political science PhD student here at Yale. My question um, in this debate about intellectual diversity, uh, intellectual pluralism, how do we avoid a negative feedback loop? So by that I mean, like also from my experience, Jewish American students seeing what happened at Columbia at Penn and saying, well, why would I apply to those schools? You go to, I'll go to Florida and everything will be okay. How do you go to conser conservative professors, even if these universities want to hire more you know, intellectual diversity or maybe bring in more intellectually diverse students and they're saying, well, I'll still be a minority, there'll still be problems, in the short term it won't be that much better, so I'll just go to Hillsdale, I'll just go to University of Austin, I'll just go somewhere else. So how do you actually, how can these universities actually show, okay, in the short term things aren't going to be perfect, but we're making an effort and you should still commit to being this you know, em often embattled minority. So um, I, I want to say a word for the glory of these universities on their normal days. And, and, and so, I mean, I've, I've been critical of Princeton, Harvard, and Yale, and Columbia, and, but they are really wonderful places. And so I, I wouldn't, I don't, I, I, they just have to change. And, but I, I don't know what you mean. I mean, I, I think the way you, if you, I would never say to someone who's offered an opportunity to, to bring something that they think is great and, and precious, and they may have a view that is counter to what it looks like in the media is at Columbia. I would never say, well, don't go because you're, you'll be alone. I would say go and, and hold your flag up and, and get in there uh, because those places, let's be honest, they have so much else to offer in so many ways. And as, as Keith pointed out, they have financial resources that allows them to protect you in a way that other than some of these newer places may be not so easy. So I, 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 you know, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't give in to that fear of being a minority. I do think it's a real risk, though. I think you're right. I'm not saying that's how it should be, but I think that is what's happening. It's a little bit like what's happened with the states. I live in Florida because I didn't want to live in Connecticut anymore. I love Connecticut. It's a beautiful <laughs> state. I'm not saying that because I'm here. <laughs> I, I'm not saying that just because I'm here. I lived here for four years. I loved it. It's, it's great. I miss the, the trees in the, well, you would say fall. I was about to say autumn and out myself, but 
But it is what's happened. We are sorting ourselves as, as Americans, and that is, a, that is a real risk. I mean, you, you have to stop it, though, because it's what they wanted. If you go back to the Students for a Democratic Society's mission statement in 1962, people always think this is a conspiracy theory to actually show it to them. They said it. Students for a Democratic Society said the universities are very powerful, very influential, and they carry a cachet, and if we can take them over, then we will have more power in the United States, and they did it. That was 62 years ago. They succeeded in doing it, and the only way to stop that is to take them back. But again, it's difficult on an individual level not to succumb to what you just described. And I think the Jewish example is a really good one, because especially if you think that you're going to be targeted on the basis of your religion or your ethnicity, why, why would you go there? So it is tough. And I, I think you are a catalyzing change by making a decision not to patronize these institutions. They will respond eventually. You know, I mean, Tulane University right now is over 30% Jewish. It's in New Orleans. That seems <laughs> counterintuitive. Oh, but it, but, you know, but, uh, but that's, it's a place that's op openly embraced Jewish students. And because of that, it's become enriched by their presence. And, and other institutions have lost, lost something important. And I think that kind of migration, I think ultimately there'll be a kind of course correction. But I think students making choices for that reason is actually helpful to the whole system. The best and brightest should think twice about whether or not they want to attend institutions that are going to treat them in a hostile fashion. They should. Some will choose to attend those institutions. And I think those, that there'll be something very rewarding in making that decision. I do. I think raising your flag and being courageous, there's reward. Some will choose to go elsewhere and put pressure back on the system. Well, we've heard some wonderful thoughts here today. Um, would the audience please join me in thanking these wonderful guests?